let's read from the text that was assigned to me. The seventh and final word of Jesus comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23 and verse 26. And it reads like this. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his holy word. Father, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you because you are my only strength. And thank God you are my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take your seats. I grew up a and me, but I had a mama who grew up Kojic, so this is how I know how to start. I give honor unto God, who is the Alpha and Omega, my beginning and my end. I give honor unto his son, Jesus, who is my Lord and my Savior. And I give honor unto the Holy Spirit, who is my comfort, my teacher, and my guide. To God be the glory for all that he has done. Can I get an amen? amen? I give honor to the set man and the set woman in this house, to the, my fellow servants in ministry, to the worship leaders, and then as they said in my mama's church, and all the saints and friends, God is a good God. Oh, yes, he is. If I were to attach a title to my time with you, I would say this. It is finished, Reverend Giddens but it ain't over. Matter of fact, why don't you tell your neighbor, I don't really like talking to my neighbor during services, just so you know, but go on and tell your neighbor, it is finished, but it ain't over. Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. These are Jesus' dying words. Into your hands I commit my spirit. He didn't just say them. The scripture tells us that he cried out with a loud voice. So if I were to be accurate, it would be, Father, into thy spirit, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Often, at least in the movies, we see people on their deathbed, ready to take their dying breath. They're weak and they're frail and they're breathless and then they whisper something that the broken-hearted loved one that's sitting there with them can't quite hear. So the loved one bends down and gets closer to hear what the dying person is saying. And in the movies, it's usually something like, I love you. Or tell so-and-so, I love them. Or... I'm the one who killed Sally. <laughs> they say whatever it is that is important to get off their chest. But that is not the case with Jesus. He didn't whisper. He didn't mumble. Oh, no, the Bible says he cried out with a loud voice. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So you have to ask the question, why does he yell? Why does he cry out? Generally, we raise our voices to be heard. When there are other noises and voices in the atmosphere, we raise our voice so that the sound of what we're saying transcends above everything else. I wonder if that was the case for Jesus on that fateful Friday. Was the atmosphere loud with teasing and taunting and sneering and jeering and for some moaning and crying? Did Jesus raise his voice so that he could be heard? You see, dying words, especially when spoken in the throes of persecution or great suffering, are significant. They often reveal a man's true value. So if we dig a little deeper, we find that Jesus' dying words are actually a quote from the Old Testament. 
Reverend Darius already knows that when he says, into thy hands I commit my spirit, he's actually quoting King David, who wrote in the 31st Psalm, verse 5, the very same words. If you look at Psalm 31, verse 1, David writes, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Verse 4, he goes on to say, Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. And then finally, verse 5, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm in a jam, Father. This is real bad. I'm not going to make it out of this one. So I put my spirit into your hand. Now let's take a look at two things in the time that I have allotted to me. Jesus adds a word in quoting David's song. Jesus adds the word Father. And then the second thing is he commits his spirit to the Father. And that's significant. Remember that. Put it in your pocket. We're coming back for it in just a minute. First, Jesus called God Father. It's interesting to note that it's only in the first of his seven last words and this last of the seven last words does he address God as Father. We already know from the preached word that he said, my God, my God, when he was asking, why have you forsaken me? But here he says, Father. He's showing that God was even in this moment still his daddy. And he trusted the Father to receive his spirit. We see Jesus dying even as he lived in total and complete and utter dependence on the Father. J.L. Packer in Knowing God writes this, For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctively Christian as opposed to merely Jewish, is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. Packer goes on to say that there are four implications of fatherhood. The first is authority, and then affection, and then fellowship, and also honor. I would like to also add that fatherhood implies intimacy, trust, and reliance. The scriptures tell us that we are sons of God through Christ Jesus. We are joint heirs with Christ. We have a right to the inheritance of the kingdom of God. C.H. Spurgeon writes this, in this fact lies our chief comfort in our hour of trouble, in our time of warfare. Let us say, Father. Jesus shows us that in the worst of circumstances, when things can't get any better, yes, I did say better, and I said it on purpose, we can call on Father, our Daddy God. God, our Father, will take care of us. He will comfort us. He will dry our tears. He will wrap his arms around us and nestle us in his bosom. I'm so glad to know that when all hell has broken loose in my life, I don't just have a God, I have a father. Can somebody say thank you, Lord? When all hope is lost, you can cry out, Father. When the diagnosis is terminal, why don't you say, Father? When your loved ones are said, have said they're done and they're gone, go on and cry out, Father. He's our Father and He will never leave us nor forsake us. As a matter of fact, when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, the first word He said, said to them was father he said our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name so on the cross after being betrayed by Judas after he was brought before the chief priest and arraigned by Pilate and examined by Herod after he was scourged and crowned with thorns after he was crucified when death was certain and imminent Jesus calls on God his father. He says, I give you my spirit. The spirit means in this scripture, 
person or life or destiny. Jesus was giving God himself in this dire and desperate hour. You see, Jesus entrusted his life beyond physical death to God. He was trusting God to raise him from the dead and give him a new resurrection body. He was giving God his destiny. Now, before we go any further, I want to stop and point out something that has already been mentioned twice today. That is when Jesus uttered these words. If you back up in Luke chapter 23 and look at verses 44 and 45, you'll see that it says, now it was about the sixth hour. And there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened. Well, if you haven't been to seminary, I'm here to tell you the sixth hour is what we know to be as noon. Noon, high noon. So darkness fell at the brightest part of the day. And it stayed dark until three o'clock. So Jesus cried out these faithful words, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit in his darkest hour. It got dark from noon till three. Now think about that. Noon is the brightest part of the day. It's the hottest part of the day. It's the time when you should know where to go. It should be easy to figure out directions at noon. The sun is at the highest in the sky and the shadows aren't even long at that time of the day because it's bright. It's supposed to be bright because it's noon. It's the middle of the day. Oh, but at this hour, on this day, on this noon, it was not bright. It was dark. The word says the sun was darkened. So let me ask a question. Did you think that this time in your life was going to be bright? Did you think that this was the time for things to be good for you? Was it supposed to be your prime, your best years? Did you think that by this time in your life, things would be settled and you shouldn't be working so hard anymore? It's noon. Your outlook should be rosy. <laughs> should have lost the weight by now, should have been married by now, should be manager by now, should own a home by now, should be over the breakup by now, should have forgotten about him by now, should have moved on from her by now, should be sober by now, should have your own business by now. It's noon, but it's dark. I said it's dark. Can't catch a break can't keep up, can't get yourself in gear, can't see your way forward, can't pull yourself out of the hole, can't stop thinking about the pain, can't stop wondering what if, can't stop texting him, can't stop tapping that. It's noon, but it's dark. It was at this point in the dark when Jesus was on the cross that he committed his spirit to God. On an obvious level, Jesus was putting his post-mortem future in the hands of a heavenly God. It was as if he was saying, whatever happens after I die is your responsibility, Father. But what we know now is when Jesus committed his spirit to God, he wasn't giving up. He wasn't giving in. Jesus knew something very important. He knew that beyond this horrific death, he was facing something marvelous. You see, the last word while Jesus was on the cross is not about that day, what was happening at that moment. And it was not even about what had happened in the past, what had led up to those circumstances. You see, that last word that Jesus spoke from the cross was not about being betrayed by Judas for 30 shekels, the price of a slave. It was not about being abandoned by all his closest confidence, even Peter the rock. It was not about praying so hard in the Garden of Gethsemane that blood poured forth from his pores. It was not about being tried in six courts and slandered and lied on. It was not about being blindfolded and whipped and enduring the humiliation of being adorned with a crown of thorns and a scratchy wool 
robe. It was not about being sentenced to the most cruel and humane of sentences hanging on the cross. It was not about being beaten until his flesh and his muscles literally shredded and his internal organs exposed. That word on the cross that day was not about being traded for a murderer or hanging on a cross between two criminals, one of which had the nerve to heckle him, hanging up on the cross along with him. This seventh and last word was not about Jesus, the word, leaving his throne in heaven and becoming human flesh. It wasn't about the miracles or the sermons. It wasn't about the past. Oh, what I'm trying to tell you is this word, this word, Father, I into your hands I commit my spirit was not about Friday night but oh bless God that word was about Sunday morning you see the power of the cross is not just that Jesus died there the power of the cross is that early on a Sunday morning the stone was rolled away he shrugged off the grave clothes and he rose again that word was not about the day that he was in it but it was about the day that he knew was coming all because Jesus commended his spirit to God even after being facing human physical death he knew he still had work to do after he breathed his last my Bible tells me that Jesus descended into hell and now he has the keys to death and hell my Bible tells me that the corruptible became incorruptible, that the word became flesh, shrugged off the earthly carcass, and took back his rightful place in the kingdom. My Bible tells me that, see, you see, committing his spirit to God was assuming his rightful position in the kingdom, and now death has been swallowed up by victory. This seventh and final word was about Jesus being able to proclaim, oh, death! Where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Jesus dying for our sins was a part of his work. But the blood of any unblemished lamb could have covered the sins of the people. It was Jesus' work after the cross that, was brought, that has brought our victory over condemnation. Oh, and authority over the devil and power to move heaven and earth by the name of Jesus. You see, it was the work after the cross that allows us to cast out de demons and they must flee in the name of Jesus. It's the work after the cross that allows us to take up a serpent or drink any deadly thing and it shall by no means harm us. Yes, it's the work after the cross that allows us to lay our hands on the sick and the Bible says they shall recover. Oh, it's the work after the cross that allows us to take the authority that's in the name of Jesus and run the devil out of your home. Run the devil off your job. Run the devil out of your marriage. Run the devil out of your children. Run the devil out of your own crazy mind. It's the work after the cross. Oh, hallelujah. It is the work after the cross that allows us to ask anything in the name of Jesus and he will do it. Because saints, it ain't over even when you die. I'm here to inform you that death is not the end. So your dream died, but it ain't over. So your loved one passed away, but it ain't over. So you got laid off your job. Oh, bless God, it ain't over. So you got passed over on that promotion, but it ain't over. Sometimes I'm here to tell you the most powerful stuff happens after death. Some of us need to let some stuff die anyway. We keep trying to keep old dreams and old goals and old habits and worst of all, old relationships alive. Oh, we're doing CPR and putting a defibrillator on it and boop, shocking it, trying to keep that thing going. Oh, but hallelujah. God says if you let it go, watch what I can do with death. Death ain't nothing but a thing to God. Oh, it's just a bump in the road. You see, when death runs into the power of an almighty God, death has no 
for no choice but to get out of the way and make room for life. So here is the good news. Here's the real good news. If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, oh, he raised him from the dead, he'll also give life to your mortal body. Oh, hallelujah. Let me say it again because it's just that important. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you if the spirit of Jesus that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you I don't think you get it I don't think you understand you see Jesus was flesh just like you and me he took the stripes upon his back and they drug him up Golgotha's path and then they laid down a wooden plank and they nailed him his hands and his feet and they lifted that cross up with his body beaten and dehydrated and worn hanging for you and for me the Bible tells me oh that he hung there and he wouldn't get down because he knew it wasn't over so the Bible tells me that he breathed his last but before he did he said father into your hands I commit my spirit the scripture said he died the scripture said he breathed his last as a matter of fact we know that they laid him in a tomb we know that the women wrapped him in the grave cloths we know that he stayed there three days Oh, but hallelujah. Thank God for the praying women that went to check on my Jesus. And when they got there, they saw angels sitting on the rock. I imagine in my mind, they're swinging their feet because ain't nothing happening there. And the angels asked the women, why are you searching for the living among the dead? You see, it's that spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead that can quicken your mortal body. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. So commit yourself into the hands of God. Commit your future into the hands of God. Commit your family into the hands of God. Commit your body into the hands of God. Because even if death comes in the hands of God, there's an example on the cross and a promise in the word that resurrection is coming. Resurrection is coming. Oh, I declare you shall live and not die. Because when you're in the hands of God, it ain't over. You are more than a conqueror. Because when you're in the hands of God, it ain't over. When you have been crucified with Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin. Because when you're in the hands of God, it ain't over. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new Cause when you're in the hands of God It ain't over All your needs Shall be supplied According to his riches and glory Cause when you're in the hands of God It ain't over Oh hallelujah You can make it You can make it through this season of trial You can make it through this season of challenge You can get through this stuff because if you will simply do what Jesus did commit your spirit commit your life commit your future commit your destiny to the hands of God because it ain't over oh it ain't over it ain't over hallelujah I'm reminded of a time and then I'm going to be done it was many years ago. I was competing in a pageant and I wanted to make it to the national pageant. And I wasn't the right type to win this pageant. First of all, I wasn't white. Second of all, I didn't have blonde hair or blue eyes. And I wasn't necessarily skinny, but I wanted this. And thank God for my praying mama 
who believed the word. And she said, if you will trust God and put your life in his hands, he will elevate you to the top. Well, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but I can tell you that I tried and I tried and I tried and I would win a local and make it to state. And I didn't win the state and I'd win another local and make it to state. And this went on for six years. I ended up being first runner up in the state of Arkansas for two years in a row. I thought I was gonna win that year. I had named it and claimed it. I had believed it, thought I was gonna receive it. I had blabbed it, was ready to grab it. In fact, folks had laid hands on me and said, thus saith the Lord, you shall be Miss America. And so I decided that I believed the word of the Lord. And I went up on the stage that night expecting to win. I was the odds on favorite. I was the returning first runner up. There was a tradition in the Miss Arkansas pageant that the returning first runner-up usually came back and won the next year. It had happened eight times out of the last nine years. So I walked on that stage with my back straight and I did my turns and I waved and blew my kisses and I thought, this is it. I'm gonna beat Miss Arkansas. Well, I went through the competition and I got to the end and they began to call the names of the runners-up. And they got to fourth runner up, and I wasn't even thinking about it. I knew it wasn't me, but I said, Lord, don't let it be me. And they called somebody else's name. And the MC got to the third runner up, and I said, Lord, please, don't let it be me. And they called somebody else's name, and I said, sure, thank you, Jesus. And then they got the second runner up, and then the scientific mind that I had began to calculate the odds. The fewer paces that were left means the, the higher the odds were that I would get nothing. So when they got the second runner up, I said, Lord, your will be done. <laughs> and they called somebody else's name, and I said, sure, thank you, Jesus. And then they got to first runner up, and if you've ever watched a pageant before, at least in the old days, it was this long speech they would give. In the first runner up is very important because in the event that the winner did not complete her duties, the first runner up will step in to fulfill the title. And while that uh, MC was saying all of that, I was going through in my mind what prayer I was going to pray. And I finally decided there was no better place to be than in the will of God. So I finally said, begrudgingly, if I'm being honest, about it. Lord, your will be done. And they said the first runner up is Miss White River, Debbie Turner. And I plastered the smile on my face and I thanked the judges and I acknowledged the other girls and I got my useless silver chip tray and I went and stood over to the side while they announced what everybody else wanted to see. The winner. Well, I was heartbroken. I thought I was gonna win. Everybody said I was gonna win. Folk prophesied that I was gonna win. I got back to my room. I asked my family, just give me a minute. I just need a minute alone. And I, as I was walking down the hall toward my room, the sobs began, be, began to come up. By the time I got to my room, and this was so long ago, they still had keys that you put in little eye. I'm fumbling with the key, and I'm beginning to cry, but I'm trying to hold it in, and I'm like, mm. And I finally get the key in the lock and I turn the door and I can get no farther. I fall on the floor. The door closes behind me and I begin to sob harder than I had ever sobbed at that point in my life. And I just said, God, I don't understand. I don't understand. I did what you told me to do. I've lived up holy, holy and upright before you. I've obeyed you, God. I don't understand. If you had told me not to do this, I wouldn't have done it. Why, Lord? Why? I don't understand. And I I cried until I literally cried myself out. I don't know if you've ever been to that point where you cry to the point where you just don't have no more tears. The pain ain't over, but there's just no more tears. And I got to that point and I laid there just in a spent, weak mess. And it was at that point, at my darkest point, I heard the Lord say as clearly as I'm talking to you right now, Debbie, I'm faithful. Now get up. 
And I got up and I washed that war paint off my face and took a shower and went and ate pancakes like they had never uh, been made before because I had been starving up to that point. And I didn't know what the Lord was going to do. But I did know that when the Lord speaks, it's a yea and an amen. I did know that he, oh, who is faithful to complete a good work in me, who started it, is faithful to complete it. And I got on up. And the next year, I went to Miss Missouri. Thank God for another state. And I won Miss Missouri and went on to the Miss America pageant. And thank God, one that changed my life. But the reason that I told you the story is sometimes when you're laying in a pool and a puddle of your own sorrow and despair, I believe the Lord has sent me here to tell you he's faithful. Now get up, because it ain't over. Oh, no matter what it looks like. It ain't over, no matter what the doctor said. It ain't over, no matter what your mama and them said. It ain't over, no matter how bad it feels. It ain't over, it ain't over, it ain't over. Because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, it ain't over. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I believe the Lord is speaking to someone today. You have reached the point where you were about to do that crazy, desperate thing because you thought it was over. You'd reached the point where you were about to walk away from church, walk away from God because you thought it was not, that it was over. Some of you have reached the point that you're going to go ahead and compromise but because you, you thought it was over. But thank God, thank God for a Sunday resurrection morning. I speak the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. If you had made it to a point of giving up, I just want to agree and pray with you and thank God for the resurrection power. If that's you, if the Lord has been speaking to you, come on down and we're just going to pray you right on out of that grave. We're going to pray you right on out of that rut. We're going to pray you right on out of that dark spot. Just come on down because it ain't over, saints. It ain't over. It ain't over. Hallelujah. If you do not know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins, that means that you haven't said Jesus. Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Today is your day. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. The Lord has brought you here because he wants to do something amazing in your life. Today is your day because it is not over. If you are ready for the Lord to be Lord of your life, come on up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I believe there's somebody here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father.